Thanks for coming, guys. I don't know if you people are maybe a little bit confused, but actually the talk about militarizing your backyard is in, I think it's in the room next door. So if you want to leave right now, I fully understand. Um, so my name is Gabriel, and uh, as I was just introduced, I uh, work at DotCloud. Uh, so we're an application platform uh, that makes it a lot easier to build and scale your web apps. Um, and so as part of this, we collect a lot of data. Um, there are two main types of metric-based data that, uh, that really have given us headaches in the past couple of years. Um, so the first is HTTP metrics, um, and that I'm actually going to come back to a bit later. Uh, and the one I'm going to talk about right now is container metrics. Um, so basically what we do is we, we take our customer's code uh, and we, we run it for them, basically. Um, so we, we spin up virtual containers uh, and keep track of a lot of uh, things about you know, RAM and CPU usage, um, like their RSS, their like, resident set size of their memory, uh, the buffer cast meshes, all, all this hardware information. Um, so we have tens of thousands of customers, um, many of whom have dozens of services with us. Um, and each of those services spews out something like 20 or 30 metrics every second. Um, so that means basically all in all we're dealing with sort of millions of data points per minute, um, which puts us in the mega data zone. Someone got that. One person laughed at my terrible joke. Come on, metric prefixes? I'm from Canada. Give me a break. <laughs> okay. Um, so let's take a step back to the good old days when managing data was easy. So this was version one of our um, metrics collection system. So when we started out, we were collecting all these metrics uh, using CollectD, which is a pretty standard tool for doing this sort of thing. Uh, and we're sending them to a single RRD. Um, and that, so RRD is a tool for, for storing and retrieving uh, this sort of time-based metric data. Um, so things worked out all right uh, until one day they stopped working out all right. Um, so as inevitably happens with every uh, single node database, when you start to scale, eventually you hit a right rate limit and things blow up. Um, so we went back to the drawing board and came up with version 2, which you'll notice looks strikingly similar to version 1. Um, but there's one key difference. Um, so there's an interesting property of RRD tool, um, that's the, the database that we're using, um, and that's that it, it automatically purges old values, uh, sort of like logarithmically, so what it actually means is that it, it keeps, it only uses constant space uh, for each metric it's collecting, and um, then we noticed that the constant space it was using uh, wasn't all that huge, it was only about 30 gigabytes, just the write rate was really high. Um, so we did what any sensible engineers would have done in our position, we got ourselves a bigger box and threw it all in memory. Um, now, of course, this isn't supposed to be done with RRD tool. It's not supported by RRD tool, but um, you know, there's nothing that like a 60 gigabyte RAM disk can't fix. Um, <laughs> so we just had to periodically stream the data straight out of RAM through gzip out to the network because we couldn't ever write it to disk because it was turning over too fast. Um, you know, no big deal. <laughs> uh, except, of course, when a machine went down and we lose hours or days of data. Um, so yeah, uh, at some point though we, you know, all good things must end, um, and despite our best hacks, we really did run out of RAM, uh, and we didn't have any more space to throw our, throw our data in. Uh, so the solution, obviously, was more RAM. Uh, so we sharded the in-memory RODs um, and kept it all in memory still. Um, and so each CollectD sends their, uh, their data to a single CollectD router, which is the big arrow in the middle, which then uh, shards and dispatches um, everything to the right shard. So you know what is even better than that old system that has a single point of failure? A system that has a single point of failure and as a bonus, Massively distributed additional single points of failure. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's what this is. Um, the other thing we wanted to start doing is that, uh, you know, we wanted to start actually using this data. Uh, and when you have, like, everything done at the RRD level um, and stored in memory and not particularly easily, um, like, for instance, we wanted to, like, show a metrics dashboard to our users when they logged in. Um, and pulling that in real time out of this sort of system it's just not at all made for it. And we tried for a little while and decided it was a terrible idea. So we have to decide what to do now. Enter Storm. So Storm is a 
a real-time computation framework. Um, so it actually, Storm can actually do, I think most people, I don't know, how many people here have heard of Storm before seeing my talk proposal? Okay, so a good number of you. Um, so Storm can actually be used as a distributed RPC system, but, um, which actually is really interesting, it's really quite cool, but what I think most people probably know it as is a stream processor, and so what I, that's what I'm gonna talk about today is Storm as a stream processor. Uh, so a little backstory. Uh, Storm was developed by Nathan Mars uh, while he was working at Backtype. Uh, Backtype was a social analytics company, um, which was acquired by Twitter last summer um, and has since morphed into the Twitter web analytics product, um, which basically what that does is it tracks every click on every tweet on Twitter, which is obviously a lot of data. Uh, so what, what sort of stuff is stream processing used for? Uh, it's used for, for things like updating databases and discarding messages, so like that's the sort of pure single directional stream um, where you just sort of throw the stuff away at the end. So this would be like maybe analyzing the Twitter fire hose. Um, it's also used for things like continuous computation where you want to know the results of a function um, continuously. So for instance, the trending topic on Twitter um, might be done this way by just continually computing a given function over, over a certain data set. Um, so when open sourcing Storm uh, this past September, Nathan said his goal was to have Storm do for real-time computation what Hadoop has done for batch computation. Um, hence the sort of weird subtitle to my talk. Um, so there are a few key properties that make Storm interesting. Um, so the first is that it's, it's high volume. Um, so there are a couple features that, that make this work. Uh, it's distributed um, and it's horizontally scalable. Uh, and what this means in the end is that it can easily sustain sort of millions of messages per second, um, as obviously is needed to deal with all the Twitter data. Um, the next is that it's a continuous system. Um, so this is, I mean, the big difference between something like Hadoop and something like Storm is that Hadoop is made for doing batch processing. Um, and for a lot of companies, a lot of people used to do, you know, they do like the overnight batch processing job and that would be good enough. Um, but for a lot of companies these days, that's not really an option to run batch jobs overnight anymore because like, just because we are asleep does not mean that the rest of the world is not tweeting. Um, or for us at .cloud, like we have a, you know, obviously we're not at Twitter scale, but we have a huge number of users in Japan. Um, so like what does overnight mean? Uh, we don't have much of a quiet time. Um, so to be continuous, Storm needs to be really robust. Uh, and so that means that there's no operational single point of failure. Um, so we'll get into the details of that a bit later, but basically if the control layer of Storm goes down, um, the actual computation layer will continue processing, uh, which is really, really important. Um, and so the network is sort of self-healing uh, and they take a really like a fail fast approach so that you monitor your processes and if anything goes a little bit awry, it dies right away and then it comes right back up very quickly. Um, because the, yeah, like I said, the sort of Hadoop style hours of downtime is just not an option. Uh, so it's also fault tolerant. Uh, so it, it guarantees data processing, um, which is quite a big deal for a real time system. Um, it's something that's not easy to do. Now, it is fault tolerant, it's not fault proof. Um, it guarantees that data will be processed at least once. So it could, for instance, for counters, uh, be processed more than once, which is a problem. Now actually, they just, I guess Nathan just cut a new release like last week, 0.7, which has features to do exactly once computations, uh, but there's a fair bit of extra work and massaging that you need to do to get those guarantees. Um, so there are also a few things that Storm pointedly does not do. Um, so at no point does Storm persist, well, do any sort of persistence. Uh, it doesn't persist any of your incoming data. Um, so like if you wanna, whatever, read off the Twitter firehose and dump it to a database, that's your own deal. Uh, but also, even with its reliability, uh, it doesn't, um, it doesn't hold these, me like, Okay, so the way that it is able to guarantee that things are processed once is that if a failure is detected, it resubmits a message through the system. Um, but it actually doesn't hold those messages. Uh, it expects that if you want to be reliable, that you are able to replay those messages for it. So it will request the message from you, but it doesn't actually store it. Um, and that's an important point because it means that it, well, basically it cuts out a huge amount of complexity uh, from the system um, because it is extremely difficult to know in a generic way what sort of data um, persistence layer makes sense. Um, so the other thing, another thing it doesn't really do very well, uh, or is not designed to do at least, is it doesn't uh, process batches reliably. Um, so th it has this at least once uh, guarantee, which is a guarantee of sorts, but it certainly isn't perfect. Um, 
And so this system isn't trying to replace Hadoop. It's a complement to Hadoop. Um, so where trade-offs were needed, in general, um, the choice was to prioritize the real-time constraint over the other constraints of the system. Um, so these two, or, sorry, these two design uh, decisions mean together that Storm doesn't protect from human error. Um, and this is something that Nathan talks a lot about. Uh, he's written a number of blog posts and a couple papers, I think, about this. Um, that, that there's a really big need for a, a two-layer data processing system where you have a, a batch processing system that's very reliable, um, that's accurate, and perhaps more computationally expensive or intensive. Um, and then a batch layer on top that's uh, faster, somewhat less reliable, um, and real time in order to fill the gap between when your batch processes have run. Um, and so it's a really, it's a really interesting approach. Um, and it has a lot of benefits because it keeps, it allows you to keep both those two systems a lot simpler. Um, and so we started, we started to try to embrace this a bunch at .cloud. Uh, and anyways, it's a very, it's a really like deep topic. Like I said, he's like written a number of academic papers on it. Uh, so I don't have time to delve into it too deeply, but if you want to chat more, I'll be around after. Um, and also, Nathan is in the process of writing a book uh, about, well, sort of advocating this method uh, and also talking about tools to use in order to implement it. Um, so I would definitely, I don't know, I've seen a pre-release version of like the first couple chapters and it looks awesome so far. So I would definitely recommend checking that out as soon as it's out, which should be later this year. Um, so okay, let's get back to Storm. Um, Storm uses three core abstractions that are really important to understand. Uh, so the first is spouts. Spouts are what inject data into your storm system. So generally, these connect to the outside world to fetch data and then admit it. Um, so this could be something like an AMQP server, uh, like RabbitMQ. Uh, it could connect to the, streaming, to the Twitter streaming API. Um, it could attach to a Redis pub sub, something like that. Uh, technically, it could also just like, emit data that it generated itself. Um, Maybe something like a clock source, I don't, or like a random number generator, I guess. I, I've never had a use for one that doesn't pull data from the outside world other than for testing, um, but technically possible. Uh, anyways, in the end, um, spouts are a source of streams, which conveniently is the next abstraction. Um, so a stream is an unbound sequence of tuples, uh, storm tuples. So storm tuples are sort of, they're pretty similar to Python, uh, basically all, like our name tuples, or name tuples in the uh, collections module. Um, so that means that basically they can have any number of named elements, and the elements can be of any type, um, but all the tuples of the same stream must have the same number of elements and that are named the same way. So basically, if you think about the name, uh, uh, sorry, a name tuple, um, it's basically like you, a stream is like a series of instances of a certain name tuple class. Um, and the, the contents of those can be any of the basic types, and technically you can write serial, serializers if you want to send something more complicated, but again, I haven't needed to. Um, our next abstraction uh, is our, our bolts, um, and bolts take inputs and transform them to create output streams. Um, so it consumes one or more inputs and produces zero or more outputs. Um, output streams. So what this means is that this could be the, sort of the terminal node in your network. Um, you know, maybe it's what actually talks to the outside world and does something real. Uh, maybe it just dumps into a database, um, but it is driven by consuming an incoming stream. Um, so this is where most of your computation will happen. Um, most of your logic, your functions. So this can do things like um, run functions or run streaming filters or run streaming aggregations or joins. But it can also read or write to a database. Um, and so, yeah, just to make sure we're clear that spouts and bolts can both produce multiple output streams, hence the dotted lines. Um, so if they're emitting multiple kinds of data, then you can get around that, that sort of constraint about that two tuples have to be um, like well-defined in advance uh, just by emitting multiple tuple streams. So a topology um, is simply a network of bolts uh, and spouts that are connected by streams. Um, so basically a topology represents an infinite computation. Um, it is continuously taking in data, uh, which is being emitted by the spouts, and then is, will, as long as the spouts are producing data, will continue to compute. Um, so it's a, it's nice, this is, um, 
like I said, this, this abstraction is kind of, it's just an amalgamation of the others, but it, um, it is a much higher level abstraction than the simple message passing that a lot of systems are built on um, at the moment. And uh, it allows you to sort of focus a lot more on doing your real-time logic rather than um, like worrying about the message passing and the serialization and all of that sort of stuff because Storm just does all that for you. Um, so, you know, no more managing whatever, distributed work queues and queues to workers to queues to workers to queues to workers, um, which results in mucho pain. Um, so spouts and bolts, although I was representing them as a single node in that previous graph, they're actually um, inherently parallel. Um, and so they execute as many parallel tax tasks across the cluster. Um, and the level of parallelism of a given component is uh, specified when you insert it into a topology. Um, so, I don't know if you guys can see all those tons of little lines down there, but that's basically the plugging that Storm does for you. Um, so, tasks pass messages directly to each other. There's no intermediary message broker like there are with many other systems. Um, and all of this messaging goes over zero MQ uh, and uses, um, uses Zookeeper for, for discovery. Um, but, yeah, so basically what it means is that it, you know, because all of this complexity is programmatically wrapped up in Storm, it uh, makes your life a lot easier. Um, so when an element um, of the topology emits a tuple, this kind of brings the question that like, where should it be directed? Um, and so Storm has another concept called stream groupings. Um, uh, so Storm, um, the first, so there's a variety of different types of stream groupings that basically are how you direct these tuples. Um, and so Storm, uh, with the shuffle grouping, Storm randomly distributes the outputs across all the tasks. Um, so this is actually, it's like, it's very simple. It's probably the most common that I've actually used um, because it basically it sort of just evenly distributes when you don't care where things go. Um, fields groupings are a bit more interesting. Uh, with fields grouping, uh, Storm hashes a, set, a specific set of fields uh, on the tuples and then uses that to ensure that um, every tuple with the same values of those specified fields is handled by the same bolt. So this allows you to do things like atomic counting, even if you're, where you're storing those counts isn't atomic. Um, or maybe it's in memory and process. Um, so all grouping can be a bit dangerous in practice because uh, it basically sends to everyone. Um, so it can sort of cause explosions. Um, and global grouping just sends to a single task, uh, the one with the lowest ID. Okay, so. We've talked about the high-level concepts. Let's dive a bit into how this actually works in practice. Um, okay, so DocCloud, I mentioned that we'd get back to talking a little bit about HTTP stuff. Uh, so we have a cluster of, D, um, sorry, of gateways that are uh, routed to with round robin DNS. Uh, and this cluster gets somewhere in the range of like 10 to 100K requests per second, um, depending on what our customers are up to. Um, and each of these requests produces several lines of log output. Uh, so each gateway has a tailor process um, running that basically grabs these, lo these raw log lines of output and just shoves them into a Redis pub sub. Um, and so then we parse these logs to extract a whole bunch of different stats. We extract like global uniques, requests per second, I don't know, like backend response time, uh, a whole bunch of stuff. Um, anyway, so we're going to look at one really specific use case of this. Um, and let's hope that this works. <laughs> Okay, so what you see here is a map with, let's move this a little bit and zoom out a little bit. Um, this is showing all of the requests currently coming into the DocLab gateways. Um, all geolocated, and then it drops a pin. It's, the granularity is not uh, particularly high because it's, uh, we're just using like a free GOIP database. Um, so it's like on a per city basis for the US, and you can see that there's exactly one point for all of Russia. <laughs> um, possibly also one point for all of Africa, I'm not entirely sure. <laughs> um, anyways, uh, so, Let's walk through a little bit of how to get something like that up and running, if I can get back to my slides. Oh, no. Let 
Okay. Okay, so here's what we want to do. We want to parse the gateway log entries to extract the IP address. Then we want to geocode the IPs. Um, we want to group the geocoded client connections um, and push updates to the client uh, once every 30 seconds. Or sorry, that's not entirely true. We want to basically, I don't know if you noticed, but like those pins are dropping in a given location not all that frequently, right? In each location, it only drops once every 30 seconds. And that's because, whatever, if you hit our, like, some given website, obviously you're going to have many hits on our gateway, uh, and we don't want to send like thousands of, you know, San Francisco is one marker. Um, so let's start by designing our topology. Uh, so we're going to use a Redis pub sub spout uh, to get a log line. Next, can you guys, can you guys read that? Uh, yeah, mostly? Okay. I know it's a little small maybe. Um, so next we send that to uh, any parser, we don't really care who because it's a stateless uh, stateless process, uh, who will extract the IP address information. Um, then we'll pass the IP address along to the geolocators. Um, and again, we don't care which geolocator is geolocating the given IP. Um, and then finally, the geolocations will be fed to a pusher um, that will send them to the client's browser via whatever, an RPC, uh, RPC call to a WebSocket server. I don't know if anyone was at the zero RPC talk earlier by my colleague Jerome, that's what I'm using. Anyways, um, so this last step is a bit more interesting because we want to bucket these updates to ensure we aren't pushing the same geolocation, like I mentioned. Um, and so to do this, we need to use a fields grouping. Uh, and so this ensures that a given geolocation is always pushed to the same, or always passed through the same pusher. Okay, so we've got our design. Now it's time to code. Anyone want to open up Eclipse? Um, so the, the thing that we skipped over, <laughs> is, oh wait, yeah, uh, Storm is actually, it's like a JVM based tool. Um, it's about 50-50 Java enclosure. Um, there are a few lines of Python in there, uh, but most of the public APIs that are documented are in Java, not enclosure. Although I think actually Nathan uses more closure personally. Uh, so why am I talking about this at PyCon? Um, so Storm has what they call their multi-lang API, uh, which maybe some of you have seen. Uh, and at the moment it basically, just allows you to write um, these, the bolts, the like processors, um, using what they call script bolts, uh, which are, it's basically a thin, you write this thin Java wrapper class that essentially shells out to a Python process. Um, and then in that Python process, you can do your computation and pass results back and forth over standard in and standard out. Um, it, it does work, but it's like a really minimal amount of the system that you're actually able to do this way. Um, and it still requires that you write your overall application in Java. Um, so, as you can maybe tell, not that big a fan, but don't worry, I got your back. Um, so, I actually would have liked to have shown a Java example, really, but it would not fit on a slide. Um, <laughs> it actually wouldn't fit on six slides, so I kind of gave up. Uh, so instead, I built a project called Umbrella to protect you from the storm. Ha, ha, ha. Uh, so basically, I implemented a Python-based DSL uh, that backs to the same thrift protocol that Storm uses to communicate internally um, between its components. And so in short, basically, this lets you use Storm uh, pretty much completely Java-free. Okay, let's take a look. <laughs> uh, so here is the definition of a Redis spout. And what you'll notice, actually, is that we aren't doing any Java but we still are able to use things that are defined in Java, because a lot of people have been writing different bolts and different spouts that are written in JVM-based languages. Um, and so what this allows you to do is, you can see here I've defined Redis spout as a JVM spout because someone yield bot, I don't know who that is, but anyways, they've written a pretty decent um, Redis-based spout any, already, uh, and we don't need to re-implement that. Um, anyway, so basically all we have to define is the field, uh, which is called message. Um, so you can see that it uses sort of a like declarative meta class type magic, which I'm sure some of you will hate me for, um, and the Django people in the room will love me for maybe, although some people think it's a bad idea too. <laughs> um, okay, so there was, that was our first bolt. Maybe I should be slipping back and forth between the, do you guys remember the, let me, let me step back for a second. Okay, here's what we're building, right? We have the Redis spout, we go to the parser, we go to the geolocator, we go to the pusher. We got that? Okay. So, we got our Redis spout. 
It's defined as in Java, so we don't have to really do very much. Next one, we define it ourselves. Oh wait, look, we still don't have to do very much. <laughs> um, so this log parser, whatever. I'm actually not doing the ugly regex stuff in here. I'm just calling a parse log uh, function. But you can see the basic gist of it is that you, you, know, you still define your fields. Um, and you'll notice I'm defining these on a class called default. That's because, um, whatever, that's sort of a, the storm name for the default output spout uh, is called default. Um, if you want to define additional ones, you can define them with additional names. Um, and basically what will happen is that you will receive an input tuple um, that you will then get the message out of. And so that was what was defined in the, in the previous, um, in the spout. Uh, and then you will emit an IP address that you have parsed from that. Um, so the geolocator bolt is the next one up. Uh, and it's a little bit longer. Still not too bad for a slide. Um, so again, we have a default output stream, uh, and it defines two fields called latitude and longitude, or lat and long, because they fit on a slide better. Um, and it just calls the pygeoip database thing that you can download for free, thank you whoever did that, <laughs> um, to geolocate it, uh, and then emits the latitude and longitude as a tuple. Uh, next up is the WebSocket pusher bolt. And so this is where things get a little bit more interesting. Um, not that much more interesting, but we uh, pull in this zero RPC client that I was talking about, which is just whatever, it's an RPC server, or an RPC client implementation. Um, and then basically we are, so in the execute method, we are getting the input, um, and then I'm using something that essentially batches, um, batches these up based on the current time, uh, and so then I emit the current batch, um, sorry. I push, sorry, right, I push to the client the current, the batch that has currently like come due, um, and then push the most recently received into the buffer. Okay, so here's where we sort of tie it all together. Uh, and again, you can see it's pretty short to do. So basically, um, to build up a topology, uh, there's two parts. One is that you have to define the components that make up that topology. Um, so that is, as I said, our Redis, Spout, our parser, our geolocator, and our pusher. Um, and then there's a bit of plumbing to tie them together. And so um, you can see that basically each one of these elements has an inputs um, field. Uh, and so it's just a list, and you just start appending based on those uh, groupings that we talked about earlier. Um, so we append the shuffle grouping, uh, the shuffle grouping of the Redis, and so this is, um, you'll see that I'm actually just passing in the name of the component, not specifying specifically which, um, which tuple output stream, and that's because they all are just using default, so it defaults to default, as might make sense. Um, and then, right, the only one that's a little bit more interesting is the, the final one where we have the pusher inputs and we append a fields grouping, um, where we define the list of fields that we want to group on. Um, how are we doing for time? Okay, yeah, no, that's cool. Um, does anyone have any questions? Uh, yeah, yeah, that's cool. I have, I mean, I could go on and on and on. That's fine. That's a, a nice ending point. We have like 12 minutes on the next talk, so it was really interesting. That's why I stopped. Okay, I mean, it, Keep going, keep going. Okay, you guys see the dirty details and you're like, I want the dirty details. Okay. Uh, so let's, let's hope that these slides are in good shape, first of all. Um, now that we've seen this practical example, okay, let's take a look at uh, how some of these pieces work under the covers. Um, so inside Storm, Storm is basically made up of three components. Uh, the first is the Nimbus. Um, and so the Nimbus is the cluster's, the, sorry, the cluster's master node. Um, so if you, you, this is what you submit a topology to. Uh, and it takes the code and distributes it around the cluster uh, and launches the workers. Um, and I think I mentioned this earlier, but for its communication, it uses a Zookeeper cluster. Um, and so Zookeeper, I don't know if people have heard of it before, but it's a really kind of neat Apache project uh, that they are developing. It's, whoop. Sorry, I just had stuff bouncing up on screen. Um, basically, it's a database that's made specifically for doing this sort of like naming, config management, synchronization. Um, 
And so this cluster sort of sits in the middle of the storm cluster to do all this coordination. Uh, and so the final piece uh, that's only a little bit important is the worker nodes. And this is where the computation is actually run. Uh, so each worker node has a supervisor daemon. Uh, and the supervisor communicates with the Nimbus through the zookeeper uh, to know what workers should be running on this particular node. Um, and so the supervisor then automatically like, starts and stops the actual worker processes as dictated by the Nimbus. Uh, do I have time to go a little bit farther? Cool. Coming off when... <laughs> Sorry? Okay. Let's talk a little bit about deploying this thing, um, because we all love deploying big Java applications, right? So it's supposed to be easy to deploy this on EC2. Um, there is supposed to be like a, there's a starter project for it, uh, but personally I found it wasn't nearly as easy as it was actually supposed to be, um, because I ended up with a whole bunch of like big, ugly Java tracebacks when I was trying to push it. Um, and it wasn't really clear to me also whether this deployment was actually something that could be used for real jobs or whether it was really just sort of like an extension of the starter demo. Um, so I deployed it on .cloud. Um, <laughs> sorry, I'll try not to pitch. <laughs> um, but basically I, I used our custom service API uh, to deploy it. And like I said, I'm not going to go into a long-winded pitch of why .cloud's awesome. If you want that, you can talk to me after. Um, but suffice to say that it's pretty quick and painless uh, to get going and it will let you easily scale out your workers uh, quite easily. So I'll just quickly show this. Um, basically, you can clone a GitHub repo that I think actually exists at that location, although I'm not sure that I checked it before I went up on stage. Um, if not, I'll make sure it's there by the end of the day. Um, anyways, basically, you can clone that GitHub repo, CD into the Storm directory, um, create an application called Storm, and do a push, and then you'll have a Storm cluster running. Um, and if you want to scale up your number of workers or whatever, you can just talk about scale. Okay, that's the end of it. Um, no more pitching. Okay, I think we should probably, let's, cool. Hi, I have uh, two quick questions. Uh, one, where can I find Umbrella? Yeah. Sorry? Where can one find Umbrella? Um, on my GitHub account by the end of the day today. Good answer. Uh, second question, can you go back to where you define the topology in Python? Yes. <coughs> are you going to point out bugs in my code? Because it's entirely well, I just possible know, that they are. I just want to know what those numbers are that you're passing. Oh, sorry. Yeah, OK. So that's um, where you're defining. Remember I mentioned that you define the parallelism of a given component when you put it into the topology? Got it. Sorry, should have called that out. That is defining the parallelism of each of those components. OK, and the way you achieve uh, a topology that isn't linear is you, you append multiple kind of... Exactly. Yeah, you, so you can append multiple... Exactly. Yeah, you can append right. multiple, uh, multiple groupings uh, based on multiple different input components. Got it. All right, um, thank and you. So, yeah, like the, a storm topology does not have to be uh, like a tree at all. It can, have, it, it can be a full graph. It can have cycles. Um, obviously, that can cause problems. <laughs> so be careful when making graphs with cycles. <laughs> but yeah, totally allowed to do that. Uh, so yeah, the question was about, um, let me make sure I understand. You're asking whether you can you can secure these streams? You mean like at the, at the transport level, or um, do you just mean like in terms of just having lots of ports open? I guess the short answer is no, it doesn't do security. You need to be firewalled, um, which is a bit of a problem, yeah. Uh, because as far as I can tell, pretty much everything is just completely wide open in all of the deploys. Anyone else? All these other people that want to listen to the next talk, not me. Okay. Thanks. <laughs>